Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Shanaz Munchi. I am a senior fellow of the Atlantic Fellows of Health Equity in South Africa. I'm an occupational therapist, feminist, decolonial scholar, and activist, and learning to embrace some of my skills as a creative curator. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you today to the second day of the Ria Boa screenings that fall within the 16 days of activism against a really critical and important issue in South Africa, gender-based violence, something that women experience 365 days of a year in South Africa. So we will start with a round of introductions and then move to the screening of the first film called Loretta and They Did Not Die, which was directed by Ketiwe Ngobo. And then we will move into a discussion after the discussion, um, we will then go to the second film called Celebrating Winnie Through Song, directed by Sihle Flope, and then another round of rich discussion. And we hope that you'll stay with us right until the end. So I am going to hand over to my two panelists, um, we'll start with um, Danielle Bola and then to Charlene. And welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to seeing these films again, which I saw at um, our Boa Dialogues event with Degano. Um, my name is Danny Bola. I'm a feminist writer and editor um, and musician as well. And I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Charlene Arensa. I'm currently a full-time student, but I'm also a founder of a project called the Voice Amplifies Project in a Lifelong Fellow um, at the Kano, you know, Equity in Social Justice. Thank you so much. So just before we go into the film, I just want to echo how honored I am to be on the panel with both of you and to listen to the stories of, you know, these amazing uh, women in the documentaries, but particularly Loretta, a woman described as a writer, a feminist, author, um, an amazing mother and a woman who I think, um, you know, has moved out of what she was conditioned to, to believe um, her life was meant to be. And I think many of us as women, we we so conditioned to, to, to set aside our own needs and er erase ourselves or, or put others' needs first. And what really struck me is um, how she takes up space. And, and with that, I'd, I'd I'd like to open with um, the first form. Thank you. Loretta Ngobo is a writer, a feminist, an author, a politician, but most of all, she's been the most amazing mother to me. I think Mrs. Loretta is my hero because she did things her way. Whatever she wanted, whether it was going to Fort Hare, when no one in her district had ever been to university. She was always seeking to bring others along on this journey of hers, of finding her voice and making that voice count. She went on to teach in the University of London. She took up women's issues. She did writing. She would have been sad if um, people shied away from having their voices heard because everybody has got a story to tell. In Zulu, when we want to authenticate your origin, we ask a question, where is your navel? My navel is just down there. What I write about are things that have happened that I'm aware have happened. In recording my own reactions to them, I am also recording history. Although my grand, great grandmother was a poet, none of my family are poets. The only one who is poetic in her approach, I know she took it from my great grandmother, is my sister. It's pure Skanagazabandu, so, so poetic. No, good in writing. Sasuka Mnan. Anti Ufus Ufuse Ukoko Wit. Gishom no coco am umamgil. 
wayethi ke mangabe ezwa uhlungu bokwaliwa engasana kwa ngayile ndodi ayimlande ngaphesheya kothukela ayibongela intombi yakhe yokuqala ene sphiwo sokubongela athi qomisa amaqele nogikidi mhlukha usingabi basi beke ezigcwayeni njengenhlonyama kakuyilutho kwenenxumbini kuyinkuku yodwa onengazinto kazi ngiyawuzibika kubani ngiyawuzibika kungangaza kwaba kacela we go into story to be changed by it we go into story to be healed by it we go into story to shift our thinking our perspective of who we are and never come out of story the same way my literary background if i was to speak widely was from the traditional stories that our parents taught us as i later learned the children i was teaching if a child wasn't making much move in writing or things like that i concentrated on the story side of things and found that they soon sharpened our minds are related to storytelling ingane kwani intomi ndithumo you know those were used to educate children the stories were not just being told because you just want to tell a story there was always a lesson embedded in there it teaches you yes about your sense of identity it teaches you about um, your sense of belonging and and also the, the 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 fact that you matter my parents who were in the rural areas they didn't have a big cupboard of books but they had boxes of books my sister and i we realized that whenever our parents were talking and they didn't want us to hear what they were saying they would speak in english so we began to see the connection between the box and the language they were using in the house and uh, we got interested ourselves we began to read we began to take a lot of interest in what was the written word and what secrets it could hold ngoba ugogo wethu wafunda e inanda seminary kuse umesis edwards umuntu oqala waqala i inanda seminary ugogo wafunda wazi wafika ku standard 2 ka ukuthi she would talk a lot of english trying to jump over my head beautiful adjective of a quality thing education was fundamental in my grandfather's family and it became fundamental in my own family when my mother met another teacher she was already a teacher herself what mauta do it pass to say seven wam tata wam aplaela e inanda seminary what is a senanda wasuka umis plan sam a missionary lady yeah is a nun wa palela uma what in the elu umfundisa mina nge mali yam mina nzo te nzo padala yonge imali yes call she was head prefect of the whole seminary she was the head of the debate we knew that inanda was going to be number one because of loretta English was her mother tongue. <laughs> And when I got to Fort Hare, I was so excited by the thinking. At the time, Fort Hare was really powerful. It, it got us all to open our eyes as to what we were doing and what was happening to us what was happening to the country what power we had to change things almost every night there was some association meeting and i went and listened and and just drank all this knowledge and this wisdom this new sight insight mm -hmm. i got my political education mm -hmm. at fort hare unfortunately as a as a young student at, at fort hare i was almost discouraged you know in the art of writing because at the time when i went to fort hare there were only 38 girls at fort hare and when i say 38 i mean from the whole country and all the african states you know no matter how much effort you put in into what you thought was right the professors seemed a lot more interested in male students this prepared me for a situation where i was discouraged from writing i didn't think anybody really would be interested in hearing what i had to say
When my mother left Portair in 1953 and went on to do a diploma, she became more involved in the resistance of the apartheid regime. In 1956, she was one of the many women who marched to the union building. Our politics have always undermined women who were really onlookers and the, the cheering party. It was not until about the mid 50s that uh, women were, I will call it assaulted by the government. They began to rethink the position of uh, not giving women the passes. That's when women now began to meet. Although, you know, I have uh, written about the rural women who still surprise me to this day, how more or less on their own fought so hard uh, against the passes in the rural areas throughout the late 50s. Mum was raided when I was an infant by the police. I don't think they were even that clear about what specifically they were looking for, but I think Mum knew and I think it was within hand. So she picked me up, took that document, shoved it into my nappy, hoping that I wouldn't do anything untoward. <laughs> and then she pinched me. I began to cry. And then she was rocking me as they're looking all over for this information. But it was already sort of in safekeeping on my bottom. <laughs> the security forces came and were ready to arrest her. So she left South Africa in 1963 on the 22nd of May. She went into exile. The reason why I came into exile was because I didn't want to leave my children and go to prison with my husband. The English climate provided me with the space to write. I had lived through South Africa through so much fear England is just the right place for me. They leave me alone. When it's dark, I close the door and there's peace outside, it's quiet, and my children grow up inside. Man to Tangbalega Mapuno, Gak Ribogu, Yogu political Banga, Rubapans home to the Pumanga Ham, O Winning Angushis, Nasa Swazin, O Winning Angushis, Nasa Zambia, O Winning Angushis. Heat from inside. Next time, put on pale. I'm going to come and the So get. My first book, Cross of Gold, is a combination of a lot of writings that I, I did uh, at a time when I, I, I couldn't accept that I could write a book. I was a publisher. I was a publisher. And she was the only person that I talked about my book, about my writing. And then she says to me one day, Loretta, I would like to see what you've written. I said, no, I can't give you what I've written because it doesn't make sense to anybody else, and so on and so forth and so forth. I give it to her. After about two to three weeks, I get a letter from Longman. We've received your, your manuscript from Margaret Leacham. And to my shock, I phone her, what have you gone and done? She laughs and she says, yes, I thought it was worth something a, a good editor could put it together. So we started working on it. Feminism is what I found in England. At first, it kind of jolted me. I was being attacked by feminists. Right through this book, women are not free. Feminists were not happy. The psych in me told me that women could not go far. I, I've had a struggle, which fortunately, the feminist experience in England helped me overcome. So she was really, I think, acutely aware through her own experience of how black women are made invisible as producers of knowledge. So she provides this platform with Let It Be Told 
And that is what is so incredible about her, that she was a writer for other writers. So I think that's something that a lot of the newer writers take for granted. They don't know the struggles that your mother had to go through. I was really very um, engaged by the fact that she had that anthology, Let It Be Told. That was showcasing black British women writers in essays. So that was an important landmark to me. And the fact that your mother did that was an important indication of how she saw the importance of getting black women's voices out there. But there was a book that I'd always known mm -hmm. I would write, mm -hmm. a story of women mm -hmm. who had brought me up. <laughs> The story of my life, my, my childhood, of the life of uh, migration, people leaving the, the, the rural areas to go and work in the cities. What life meant to me as a child in, in that rural part of South Africa. And that's why there's a lot of that in and they didn't die. When we see, for example, a writer like Alan Payton, who writes about the same community um, in Cry the Beloved Country, he has one African woman, Marku Malo, and the only line he writes about her is she stood at the window with bovine eyes, mute with the suffering of oxen. That is African women in the imagination of a white liberal. That is the tradition that she enters into, Mrs. Noble, and writes these rich, fully agentic lives for these women. They are mothers, they are wives, they are sexual. In short, what she does is she confers full humanity and dignity to women who have been looked at as objects. But I was not free myself at the time. Even while I wanted to write this book, even while I started to write this book, I think my own liberation came through this book. Wow, <laughs> this is such a powerful documentary. And I mean, I think what's so extraordinary about Sis Loretta is that she didn't just use her voice or take up space. Um, she took it up in her own way and in an authentic, powerful way. And when taking up issues, it wasn't just her issues that she took up. She took up issues of other women, of the community, of a struggle that was so much broader than her. And it's a real legacy and an important point um, for, for me to hold quite dearly. Um, and so I'm going to start with the first question that I'd like to um, speak to Charlene about. As, as a fellow fellow, as you reflect on Loretta's life story and her experiences in relation to your own life, and your own experiences. What are the thoughts that come to mind? How does this make this film make you feel? Okay, thank you, Sanazia. Yeah, I think every time I think I watch this video four times already, and every time I watch the video, I get emotional. I think it's mainly because it speaks about her navel and it speaks about leaving the place. And you know, a navel is important for a human body to survive. And for her to leave a place and go into exile and hide with her children, in my imagination, I just try to think how she must have felt um, after leaving a place where she grew up, where she was born, in the leaving the people who raised her. Because I myself um, live on a farm. I left the farm, I think, 
two years back and for me I, I i longed for the nature i longed for the people i longed for the community and for me i get really emotional when i think about how she has maybe felt when leaving um, her navel and leaving the place where she, she she saw the nature she saw the people she saw the, the surroundings i mean i also think what what stood out to me in the video is she speak about the importance of story owning your own story owning where you're from owning um the power in storytelling um and i'm i'm i think i can reflect about my what i'm currently doing and then how i use this project um when it comes to educational support in the um we, had a, we also have a book club where we just read to the kids and ask them questions stories also about identity feeling at home but asking questions engaging with with children and she speaks about the importance of education and i think what makes me really sad sometimes when i sit with the children is the pandemic brought so much we it is now is visible we can see it um because it was it was under the car but we, we didn't see anything uh, it wasn't so visible but now i can clearly see that children are struggling especially children going to farm schools they are struggling to read they are struggling to understand the curriculum they are literally struggling and for me growing up on the farm still being on the farm it, it is it's just difficult um when especially when it comes to trying to teach the children how to read and literacy is a big big problem when it comes to farming communities um and for me i think what makes me emotional is the fact that although she went through so much she still wrote the books she still speak about the community she still went back to, um, to her own community where she grew up and i think that the same year when i came back home i was literally emotional for the i was literally emotional for a whole week because i was crying i saw the kids they came and ran and the people came and said, hey, welcome back um so you miss and stuff like that because living in a farming community and just seeing the the space where she grew up is just something else in in sometimes we can't describe to some people when we say we want land we want access to land um so, so i think for me it's about owning your story owning your identity in the power of education um and what really makes me emotion is for her to leave a navel um i think that is where my emotions come in um and then just hearing her speak with so much i've got the side that feminism that power um um power in storytelling for me. Yeah, thank you, Shanaz. <laughs> so I, I feel quite, my body's a bit tingly at the moment, just listening to you talk. Um, I'm going to turn to Danny now. Um, I don't know if it's Danielle or Danny, I'm not sure which one you prefer. I can please you can go with either. Okay. How does this documentary make you feel? as a woman in South Africa? What, what are your initial reactions? Um, as a storyteller, writer, feminist, musician, um, something about the power of stories and the secrets that Loretta speaks about in the written word, and perhaps mm -hmm. this thing of connecting to a sense of identity or belonging, this is how she sees it. What are your thoughts? What does it bring up for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I really love this doc documentary. I think it's such a powerful one. And I think that it really, number one, speaks to how people get erased from curricula, how people get erased from our bookshelves. Um, I know currently there's there's um, a lot of work happening to get her, her books back in reprint so that a new generation of, of, of readers can have access to those stories. But I think that, you know, drawing on what you said previously, I keep thinking about um, this Toni Morrison quote, which is the, the responsibility that we have when we're free is to free someone else. Um, and I think that connects to what you were saying about what it means to take up space and then to open, to open room for other people to come in. Um, and I think that, that what I really connect to is that we all experience, know, and um, are very connected to the power of stories Be, because we're connected to stories and dialogue in our everyday lives. And, and mm -hmm. I think that they can serve as such a powerful communicator of uh, political um, thought and ethos and messages. And I think that that's what um, Barbara Boswell illustrates in um, her contributions to the film, where she speaks about um, Alan Payton's um, mm. 
depiction of a black woman versus what Loretta does, where she, con I think she said, she confers full humanity and dignity to women who've been looked at as objects. And I think that that for me is something that is really powerful. The fact that stories can act as a corrective to the record and to the archive and can confer dignity and humanity. Stories are where we can recognize and see and imagine and reshape ourselves. So for me, I think that's what I find really, really powerful about this particular documentary. Thank you so much. I, I, I think, you know, it's embarrassingly, I've read um, Cry the Beloved Country, but until, um, you know, even Pumla Kola brought out thinking and writing about Loretta Ntumobo, I had never heard of her. And uh, it, it makes me wonder how many other women, black women, women of color, uh, stories we don't know, and how these stories um, should be something we start seeking out and listening to and looking for, you know. And on that note, um, Charlene, you spoke a lot about this connection to this navel in the land and your community, this woman, this community of women that you live with on farms, um, and and their their response to you when you've come back and when your emotions around leaving. But perhaps you can bring some context about your story. You know, what is this project of women on farms, and um, what do you do there? And, and and why is it so incredible? Because <laughs> I think it's incredible. But share with us, you know, this, this incredible story of yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shanas. Um, and thank you, Danny, um, for that words. Uh, I think, so I, I, I was born on a farm called Kromeri outside Stellenbosch. Um, so it is a state farm. So we don't have, if it's not owned by a farm, a private owned land. So it's, it's a state farm. So it's much different than a farm, a farm that is owned by a farmer. So, um, so I was I, I I was born here, and then I, my in two thousand and six, when my mother passed, um, I think I went through the most traumatic time of my life, and I got involved it in, uh, with the organization called Women on Farms Project, and I think um, this was a period in my childhood where my mother was bitten by a farmer's dog. Um, it's just a farm nearby. Um, so she lost her ears, she had skin grafts, um, she went through, she was sa she saved off her hair because there were so many holes in the body in in her, in her head. So she needed to save off her hair. So for me, I was I had so much question was because of the issue that she was bitten by several dogs, nothing happened to the farmer. But and I was asking about why, why is this happening? Um, why can't we cross? Because to get to the main road, we can cross the farmer's land, but it's a vast land. You can just walk past, but we can't because there was a board saying private owned land. Don't so so we can't pass the the land. So we needed to take a we needed to walk as kids. We needed to take a longer route to go and access services. Um. So for me, I and it was always a problem. I was struggling with issues growing up. Um. The the question about why should I travel um so far to get a library. Why don't we have a library on a farm? So the issue about information, people, the kids will talk in class sometimes, they will speak about um, um, some NGOs that came to the community. And I was wondering, but what is happening? I never heard of these people. So when my mother died, um, I started, I think the few uh, months afterwards, a lady came from Women on Farms and I started attending the workshops. And I think is that is the organization that I grew up in Women on Farms. And I think, they, 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 they gave me so much strength in the end where I built my activism and my feminism and I could make the connection between the white supremacy, capitalists. I can I could speak about the structural violence and I understood what was happening, what happened with my mother and why the farmer wasn't arrested. So so I think that experience from my childhood in the in the, the NGO called Women on Farm that I grew up in, it was the stepping block in the especially the woman living and working on the farms was my, 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 literally my, when I cried, I, I went to the woman, I spoke to them, I went to the woman, I, I, when I felt so much emotions and anger, I, I will talk to women that loves in, um, in, um, dwell on farms. So I think for me, farm woman in, in loving on the farm is not only about where you grow up, but it's a sense of community. I always tell people when someone dies in the, on the farm, everyone is sad. When, when when someone leaves the farm, you can feel you will mourn together. Um, and then people will sometimes will, will 
when I tell them, when I wake up every day, you can hear the birds, you can hear the nature, you can feel the sense of belonging, loving and growing up on the farm. So I think for me, it's not only um, about the farm, but it's, it's, it's part of like Mam Loretta spoke about, it's my navel. The farm people, the children on this farm is my navel. They are the reason sometimes, I, I told you last night, Shanaz, Sometimes I will feel so tired and I'm like, no, I still need to do the homework support program with the kids because I'm a full-time student. But then when I get out of the taxi, they will wait for me and they will just start talking about the day. They will start talking about, I've got so many homework. And then they're literally my drive. Um, and people now, the, the woman on the farm, they call me your fro. So, so in the, the, if they want something, they will come. If they want to talk, they will come. So for me, it's my sense of, they, they are my purpose. And, and I think... The reason I'm doing this is just because I love my community. I love living on the farm. And just to think our mom, Laurita, must have felt leaving. Even that is for me, is emotional. And I think when I grew up in high school, people called me um, when I stood in front of um, all the grades because I was, every time I was in the top 10 or I, I was first place or I was second place, they will scream. I will never forget that they someone scream out of the audience. They blast and and I own being a plaskin. I was like, it's fine. I'm a plaskin. I'm from a farm, but still I'm standing here with my certificate, standing first place in mathematics, standing first place in Afrikaans, standing first place in English. But for me, it's fine because my farm is who I am and I'm owning my story. And for you to scream, Jay plaskin, it's fine. Um, and I think for me, um, when Mama Loretta speaks about navel, uh, um, your navel is, my navel is who I am. It's part of me. It's my story. It's my identity. Yeah, and I think if I speak about my farm, everywhere I go, I will say it's a plask and it's fine. So so for me, I own my navel. I love my, my, my community. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, I always love listening to you relate the stories of the work you do and the extent of the work that you do. Because as you start getting to know your story and what you do, it's extensive. It, it's so broad and, and, and we will touch on many of these as we go along in this conversation. But I want to pick up, you know, like the, the, the thing around you spoke about the, the extreme violence that your mom experienced and how there was no accountability or justice for her. So in a way, this erasure of women in apartheid times seems to continue as a thread to the women that love um, uh, in South Africa today. Um, and, and then also this idea um, of women who hold space and how you turn to women who held you and then women come to you and you hold them. And in a way, this role that women play, especially when you think of the historic nature of economic development in South Africa, where a lot of our money is made of the mines and made of the farms. And so women really carry the economy. These are the women that carry the economy. Yet these are the women that are erased, you know. And so I wanted to shift to Danny and in your piece that you wrote for the Riaboa, you wrote through moving images, the memory erasure and critical place of writers like Loretta is revealed. And uh, I just wanted you to share with us what you were speaking about there and just, you know, bringing up issues of memory or erasure. What is the place of women or writers or women like Loretta, um, women like Charlene, women like yourself, women like me today? Thank you. I think, um, you know, just what I think about and what I think is so powerful about this particular documentary is, is that um, that device that is used throughout it of collaging story. Um, and I think that that's, kind of um it's an interesting device to muse on as we work to repatch our histories and repatch the stories of who we are um and i think that hearing from all of these different people in loretta's life what what Kitiwe has done is given us a astonishingly um complex portrait of a writer and the conditions that made and and shaped her um, and I think that that's something that I, I connect to and I think about quite, um, that I think is quite significant and that emerges out of this um, documentary and that, or this, this short film. Um, and that's kind of what I was speaking about is through 
this device of moving images, meaning moving images as in as in film, but moving images as in literally playing with them and, and moving them as Ketiwe does throughout the thread of the documentary, we begin to see what it means to, to revisit and to rethink that act of making history. Um, and I think that that's what we kind of learn as we, as we grow up and grow into ourselves um, and grow into politic is that history is shaped. History does not just arrive to, uh, arrive to us unmade. Thank you, that, that's incredibly powerful. And I'm glad you mentioned Ketiwe because it's yet another creative African woman who is bringing stories um, to, 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 uh, to visit in the visibility, bringing stories to our home so that we can learn about women like Loretta in such a powerful way that really um, brings dignity to her life and her legacy. Um, so I want to go back to Charlene and, and really ask you um, to share with us, um, you know, the, the, this, the, there's this book that uh, Loretta wrote at the end, which is captured in the name of the documentary, um, which is They Did Not Die, I think, and, and They Did Not Die. Um, uh, and I, I, she spoke about this is the book that she really wanted to write. And because it was the book about her growing up and her life story and the woman who brought her up, but that she was also not okay and that this book brought healing to her life. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you can share with us um, if you find through the work you do um, and through reading and learning about her story, does it give you a sense of healing? Yeah, I, I think um, story is really an important way of, uh, of sharing your, expressing your emotions. And I think um, when I think about our stories, um, and I also think about what our women are going through, especially in today's context, the increase of gender-based violence and femicides, the, the, the child, young children getting pregnant up, that are being raped, the new um, way of slavery, especially living on the farm. Um, when I talk about new um, um new way of slavery, I, I talk about the housing contracts that are in the name of the males. Um, if you want to work as a female on a farm, you must have a male partner because he will own the house and he, it will be in his, his name. So for you to leave um, the relationship is difficult. Um, when I talk, think about the stories of the woman, I think about women that have a seasonal work because I think about them only working for a few months um, in a year. Um, when I think about stories and expressing stories, of, especially on farms, I think about the limited access to information and knowledge. Um, and I think about us as, as farm children and rural children need to travel to, to so far just to access services, just to access information. And I think for me, um, the story around education, um, I think education is a big part um, why I'm doing what I'm doing because it's my, also my first time Never in my history in school I I heard about Mam Loretta. Never did I hear about um um Ma Winnie Mandela. Is I, I never heard of them. I only heard about Jan van Riebeek. Um, and that is that is one of the things the curriculum that we have been taught in school. In for for me now, especially in the COVID pandemic, um, people don't have access to those types of information. For them, they get to work. They must leave and do the work at home. And most of the kids, um, the parents that I'm working with, they can't read and write properly. For, for, so for me, story is important. But for the kids to access their stories and to read, they must learn how to. So so for me, the, the power around um, the new norms of slavery, I also speak about the, 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 the um, patriarchal norms in our society. Um, I also work with boys, and, and sometimes I will do sessions with boys and, and, and young men, um, um, and I will talk about the norms in the house. I will talk about the generals, um, and, and, and you will be shocked when, what they, when I ask them a question like, who must do the dishes? Who must, um, who must be responsible for the baby? Everything is a responsibility of the mother. So they grow up and they normalize certain things and are still normal on farm. So, so when we speak about story, we must also include the stories and different voices in our stories. We, we shouldn't erase the stories of those who we think is, is not important or, or shouldn't be told because they are also dealing with historical um, information, historical knowledge and historical 
trauma. So, um, and I also think um, the, the, when I speak about new norms in slavery, I think about the people that, that, that worked for 20 years on a farm and suddenly when a husband dies, he must leave the farm. Or when they are old, they must leave the farm. They are being evicted. They will be thrown and dumped in places they are not known to them. Um, they, um, in, in I made a documentary a um, um, few years, um, a year back, that speaks to um, evictions uh, in humane. Um, and I think that for me is the power of the new norms of slavery. You will you will work, you will work, and suddenly we, when you're not good enough, you will be you will be um, evicted and thrown um, away like you are nothing and you are just an object because um, about the white supremacy, about capitalists, about what is currently happening in our society. And I think, um, and I think when I think about the stories, I also think about the woman that was part of the the the, the march in the Durans. They were in front of the march. They were they were toy toying. They were screaming, "We want a living wage." But sometimes when you read and you see newspapers, you will not see the names of the woman that was part of the campaigns. So for me, the stories of 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 but what Mam Loretta is talking about, the story, the power of story, we will clearly see that um, people living on farms and farm dwellers, they are fighting in, 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 in the issue about land, what is sown in social media, what is sown in what is written in social media, in, in newspapers. Um, in, in sometimes I feel a bit stressed out. I feel a bit, I'm doing, I feel I'm doing so much, but it, I, I feel stuck. Um, there's just a feeling of stuck. Um, and for me, um, to try to heal, to come back to your question, to try to heal and deal with all those things, I think, you know, I, I think we need to start f from the root cause. In, in, when I talk about starting from the root, I st I'm talking about in your house, I'm talking about your community, I'm talking about uh, um, 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 talking to your community, I'm talking about telling your story, engaging with people, um, trying to heal. But also for me as a feminist, um, I think I'm dealing with my own trauma. So while I'm trying to assist, I'm also dealing with my own stuff. Um, and that's why I started writing. And I think when I, when I, after I watched Mam Loretta's story, I just took my laptop and started writing two different short stories about um, things that I'm currently dealing with, things that, that didn't make sense for me, but now I'm trying to put it into words and expressing my feelings through writing, through um, telling my story. And I'm not... I usually say I, I, I don't care about that big words or that you must have that fancy words, but at least it's my voice, it's my truth, and it's my opinion. So, so and I like using my and making up my own words. So, so if you want a dictionary, I will I will design one and then I, I will say it with everyone. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Charlene. I look forward to that dictionary. <laughs> Um, I wanted to say, th you know, um, thank you for sharing that and, and for, for, for taking us a journey, you know, through these women and their stories. And I think one of the things that struck me yesterday was um, when you talk about the woman being evicted from the farm where their partner dies, um, it's not just that they are being evicted. They are being asked by a white owner of the farm to leave, to go somewhere. Um, and this is an act that that is happening. So some person wakes up and decides to tell a woman who's just lost her partner to leave. Um, I think it really does make me so angry and helpless at the same time, but also empowered to hear the work that women on farms are doing in so many different capacity to strengthen the voices through your voice amplifier project of the women, of the children, um, and of, of those who live on farms, who, who are proud to live uh, on farms that, that, that they live on. Um, so I am going to turn to um, Danny again, but there's a question for you from uh, Bongani. And then to invite people to look at the comments, to, to share comments, and I hopefully will get to your questions. So Bongani says, um, Loretta speaks of burning her works as a means of survival. As a creative director, how does that sit with you? As creatives, our ideas are precious to us. What are your thoughts on that? Thanks so much for that question. Um, I think when I think about that, I think specifically about strategies of survival and particularly the modes of survival that are available to us in specific contexts. Um, and especially in conditions of systemic violence, what modes and strategies of survival we can choose and what 
is available at that moment in time. So I can only imagine how difficult it must be to get to a point where your only strategy of survival is burning your creative work. Um, but I also think simultaneously in thinking about the many diverse strategies, um, I also think about her strategy of putting the document in her child's nappy at the same time and about these different strategies that appear to people at different moments. I think it's difficult to comment it on, on the strategy of someone else um, in a specific condition, um, which I think is, is, is very difficult to where we might be as creatives in particular moments. But I think that, that what the film does offer is a, a meditation on, on the kinds of st uh, strategic survivals that she chose. Thank you so much for, for that answer, Bongani. If you've got any additional comments, please share with us. And Sybil has been saying that, you know, um, it was, um, I, I'm not sure which woman you're talking about, but these are the kinds of women we need to lead South Africa. <laughs> First is a female president. And I'm, I, I guess, um, you know, it's probably all the women <laughs> in, 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 in this panel. Um, I think uh, but it was the woman, the woman in the film. Um, the, sure. the woman particularly at the end of the film yeah yeah thank you um yeah so so um i am gonna go back to charlene and talk about this, this this really like poignant moment in the film where loretta is sitting in fort hay university is that right <laughs> she was in fort hay and she goes there and you're a student a full-time student but still working on the Woman on Farms project. But she goes to Fort Hare and listens and drinks knowledge and gets political education. And she's there to learn and um, be, be transformed by knowledge. But then the structural violence of these institutions comes and haunts her in a way. And they remind her that professors are only interested in male students' voices. And in a way, it puts to question, is anybody going to listen to her story? And then leaving to go, leaving the naval, to go to a different home, to, to England, you know, um, she finds space to, to write, to write, to share her story. And she discovers feminism and a different kind of feminism to her own feminism. But she discovers a solidarity with women um, in other countries who also struggle and need to rise up um, and, and speak their voices. And I wonder, Women on Farms is a particularly feminist project. Um, how does Loretta's story resonate um, with you and both as as somebody who is in the University of Higher Learning, which is remains quite structurally violent, and then being in the um, project and on farms where you talk about women who who live in private farms don't even have electricity or water, um, and then the state farms that have these services but they aren't that great, um, and and yeah, just a reflection on all of that. Can you unmute yourself, Charlene? <laughs> yeah, I think if I understood, understood you correctly, you are talking about the, um, you are talking about the structural violence. Um, so can you just repeat the last part because I didn't hear. Yeah, I think I got quite complicated there. But <laughs> I really, I think I'm just trying to, reflect on Loretta's experience of, of discovery of her voice and then her feminism and feminism across the world, but then also realizing that when she enters the university um, and she tries to find her voice, that it's not a very welcoming space. Um, and as a woman, her voice is not always um, something that, pe that she feels that people wanted to hear. And okay. does that resonate with you? Do you feel you have a space? Um, is your voice being heard? Um, how do you relate to, and, how, and the women on farms, their voice is coming through, thanks. Okay. 
So yeah, yeah, I think I can relate. Um, I think uh, I left the Women on Farms project. I left them or oh, when I went to go and study this year. So I went left them December. So I was with Women on Farms starting from 2006 um, when I was still in high school um, till last year. So it was quite a long time. Um, but I think I'm just going to speak um, mainly about this. You speak. You spoke about you felt discouraged when 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 they um the lecture was only thinking about or um, highlighting the work of the men. Um, and I think about, we also spoke about the feminism. Um, and I think for me, feminism and feminists look different in everyone is, is their own feminist in their own way. Um, and I think for me, where, where, I, where I learn or where I felt empowered is when women tell their stories in different ways in their own language um, by owning their own stories. And for me, it is it's not a story of my own, but it's a story of the collective. Um, when women will usually say that that we on this farm or and um, you will never you will really yeah they will say I sometimes they will say we so so women is is seeing and identifying themselves as we and I think if we have the collective story it's, it's so much powerful but also owning your own story and acknowledging the fact that everyone is a feminist in their own way in a feminist or if you describe yourself as a feminist it looks different. And we are all different, but never to be discouraged by the fact that um, uh, um, you, you can do better, you will be better, and there are people watching, and you must also remind yourself that to be a collective, to voice your opinion, and not to be scared to voice your opinion. And I think um, for her, it, it was through writing stories, um, and for some women that can't write and that went uh, drop out of school because of circumstances, because they need to assist or help their parents to work, uh, or look after the children um, in, 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 in take the role uh, in the, because they are a girl, they, they have all those norms and responsibilities they must look after. For them, it was it's by because they can't read and write, for them, the power lies in storytelling. So, if in, in some, I, I remember when Women and Farm that time have workshops, one of the women will tell the story with so much power, so much, so much emotion, so much you can literally feel the the. Her own identity, the courage in her voice while she is speaking and telling the story about them going because they have no electricity, no water, no access to toilets. But for her to own the story and not be, be shy to say, okay, I'm coming, coming from this community and I'm here standing in front of everyone telling my story. Yes, I can write or read, but I'm not discouraged. I, I am powerful. I am a fem feminist. I am an activist, but I'm owning my story. Um, and going back to the same community, but every time they will feel tired, they will feel lost, they will feel stuck. But the next time they will come back in the, another memorandum over to Parliament in raising their voice and say, we had enough, we are we are done. I almost use another word. Um, um, yeah, so we are we are you are at all. So 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 for them to say we are we are over it, we but using their stories, they will and I think for me that's where I found my voice is is hearing them seeing them, acknowledging them, but see they are a collective. When they sing the songs, it is almost like they, they, they are speaking through one. So for me, is where I've, I found, found my, my, my sense of purpose is through growing up on women on farms. And especially this year, I think um, because I'm not actively in the Women on Farms project anymore, but I when I speak, I speak with so much pride about the organization because in the bout of women, especially in the children on the farms that I worked with, in the young people that I worked with, because they own their stories. Yes, um, we have a long way to go, go, but we are not sitting still. We are fighting. We are doing something. Um, and I think that is where I find my my voice in why am I still busy and why I'm still not giving up. So yeah, feminism looks different. Um, in 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 courage is in the storytelling and is in uh, um is a collective. So yeah, thank you, Shanaz. It, I'm not sure it can make sense, but <laughs> thanks. Thank you for sharing. It, it's it's really incredible hearing you. It does definitely make sense. Um, Danny, over to you. I I, I guess um, I'd love to sh share a similar kind of question around perhaps your story. You know, your story and your um, journey towards finding your voice as a writer, as a, a musician, as as a creative, as somebody who is growing up in South Africa today. Um, how, um, how does um, Loretta's, um, the moments in her life through her journey, her leaving, her, her moving, um, how does it relate to your story? And, and what are the moments that really 
come up for you as you as you listen to 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 as you watch that film. I think just to reflect on something Charlene said, which is I think is really important and really valuable, is this idea of the collective. Um, and I think Charlene was speaking about how she found her voice through others and how there's such immense power in the collective, which is what she saw in the Woman in Farms project. And I think that um, I think the journey of finding your voice is a lifelong one. Um, I think we're perpetually finding um, our voices but there is courage that comes from collectivity. And particularly, I think for me, it's been feminist collectivity um, and kind of my peers and, and um, the, the women and the feminists who came before me, who repeatedly are the ones who give me courage and who um, are the ones who remind me that that our voices are important and that our voices matter. And particularly when our voices are, um, I think that um, Arundhati Roy's framing is so valuable when she speaks about um, the preferably unheard and the, and the um, I think, I don't want to mess it up, but I think she speaks about I think the strategic- the deliberately silenced and the preferably- Deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. And I think for me that that is really powerful because it's not the idea of of um, a kind of it just speaks to the mechanics that underlie it all. And I think that when I think about um, my own kind of feminist heroes, I think that they always look towards mass action and they look towards collectivity. Um, so that's why I think what Charlene's saying is really really powerful because I do think that whether it is through uh, people writing their stories, people speaking their stories. I think that we really find um, ourselves through the, the the chorus of voices, um, and not just the, the the singular voice. Sure, I, I think what's powerful about what you're saying, Danny, is you know um, looking a little bit at. Um, feminist tools, mechanisms, and strategies that are used and which ones can be used where and how and what makes sense and how women are adapting over time to choose these different strategies or tools um, and to start to kind of capture or think about what are these, what, what are the, the strategies that work um, and what are the mechanics that are used to actually keep our voice silent, so keep us hidden or keep us, so, you know, in a way, it's it's almost what are the leverage points that we can um, use to create the changes that we want to seek. And I think um, what what I I, I always find um, writers to be incredibly um, insular, and they, it's a solitary profession, or it's a, you have to sit with yourself a lot. So it does come with a lot of internal work um, and and trying to sort of find a defining voice voice. Um, and I wonder if this has been something you've also had to grapple with or what has your journey, you know, as you draw on the collective to support you, what is your journey individually? Hmm. I mean, I think that um, writing is definitely something that you do by yourself, but I also think of it as something that's a deeply communal experience. When I approach the page, I'm approaching mm -hmm. the page with the writings of everybody who inspires me and who who has led me to become a writer in mind. I always have kind of a chorus of writers in my mind. Um, and, and I think about a community, a writing community that I'm part of, whether that be the editors that I work with or whether that be fellow writers who I will call up with to um, discuss the work or to, um, reflect on things with. I think that there's so much community in writing and we can even see it in the film because you see how um, Margaret Busby is speaking about um, Loretta's work and Margaret, mm -hmm. uh, the, pub uh, the publisher or the editor of um, Daughters of Africa, this, this incredible collection. Um, mm -hmm. And then you also see how Margaret Legion takes um, Loretta's book to, to a publisher. So you see this kind of, Solitary pr profession is actually a very collective pr um, profession. And I think that, um, yes, that, that framing 
um, invites us to, con to, to think about a different way of being in our work. And especially when our work is feminist work, it's by definition, it's a collective kind of, mm. kind of work that we're doing. Because um, again, the function of freedom is to free someone else. Um, so I definitely think about it, I think definitely think about it in that way and just to draw on what you were saying previously, like um, a lot of what I'm doing currently is just going into archive. So just mm -hmm. reading the, the kind of writers we repeatedly speak about or that we didn't get a chance to read in the curriculums that we had at school um, or the writers that we, um, that we hear their, name, their names often, but we, we don't really, um, have access to their works because I think that that what Shailene was talking about is important is that it's not just about what we um, about dealing with um, the question of reading it's the question of what are all the structures in place to keep mm -hmm. people from access so um, I think that you know just something that I, I, I think about with with um, writing as a collective project is that you're always in conversation with the archive at all times. Thank you. I mean, that's a really powerful note to end off this section before we move to the next poem. But I really want to say that that, that input is, is incredible for me because I think as someone who's learning to write in the academic space, it's, it's difficult to hold that collective voice when the academic space is such a defensive space, I find. Um, and I think um, it's riddled with so much anxiety, I guess, and, and a sort of separation of self to, to, to find an objective opinion. But I think the way you describe it feels incredibly liberating and almost like, oh gosh, I need to start writing now, yesterday. But, uh, yes, you know. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so I just want to say thank you, like really deeply from the bottom of my, my heart for that. And I hope that, you know, you, I think Charlene and I were talking um, and she was sharing about the writing that uh, you are doing. And, and I, 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 I really just feel like hope, you know, I, I think it's an inspire, it's really inspiring to, to see women writers um, in both of you. And, and it, it really gives me a lot of courage. So thank you. <laughs> Um, so I am now going to um, ask that we move over to the second film. And the second film is called Celebrating Winnie Through Song. It's directed by Sihle Klope. Thank you so much. Sound, secret, you know, is a big part of who Umamwini Umam is, you know, and I say is because I mean they continue to live through us, right? I mean, your Yvonne Chaka Chakas wrote music about Mama, women in Nigeria wrote music about Mama. But it's only later when I sort of learned that like the 80s pop stars, you know, your Brenda Fasses, your, your, your Yvonne Chaka Chaka were literally playing on that, you know, the phonetics of words. She wasn't saying Winnie Mandela, but she was like, I'm winning, winning, Mandela. I'm winning, winning. Do you remember this one? Because I'm winning, winning, Mandela. Mandela was also like a style influence on Sissy Vaughn. Music, not only South African music, but also American music became just part of the struggle. Carlene Davis, she was a famous, very, very famous uh, Jamaican reggae singer. I know that song from my childhood, and I'm sure I had I heard it at one of these rallies. She is our rev 
revolutionary hero. We need heroes. She is a grassroots revolutionary. Viva Winnie Mandela! Viva! Viva! Viva Winnie Mandela! Viva! Viva! Later on in my life, of course, I found Satima Bey's song. Mother of the nation See her love light shine Mama loved our people. She loved them regardless of whether they understood the kind of person that she was or understood the mission that she was on. She loved them um, wholeheartedly and unapologetically. The song Nong Nong uh, by Meru Makeba, I mean, it's just a haunting, haunting, beautiful song. Um, and it's the song that I grew up just hearing at parents' friends' houses when they were having, you know, planning meetings for rallies and things like that. Um, or at funerals, you know, when an expat would die, you would hear that song often. There was a lot of conscientization of Winnie. Miriam Makeba did speak a lot about Winnie. So during Fees Must Fall, you had students uh, actually appropriating Umam Miriam Makeba's uh, song that she composed, Unongongo, right, uh, which may be found in a film by uh, Sidney Poitier. Umam Leda is in that film, and that's when she's singing Unongongo. There's something about when those voices resonate, when those melodies come out, that speaks for us beyond what we could do on our own. That's why music works as resistance, because music gets to go to places where we cannot reach. Uh, music is quite central in, you know, the making of black collectives. During the Fees Must Fall movement, when Bogota Must Lead was launched, we came up with our own songs, speaking about Mama Winnie. And, you know, some of those songs, my mind is just like racing now, trying to trace some of them. Um, there's a song that says, She was as comfortable in military fatigues as she was in, you know, those Black Panther leather jackets, you know, as she was in like African culture. It's a very militant song. Right, it, it stirs up an energy. Mom Winnie knew about the songs, you know, and you would actually see the smile if, if we're in the car, you know, and they're playing the song, and you'd see the smile on her face, you know, I would like check on her how she feels and you'd see the smile. Then you have Tandis Wama's Why. You know, our, our young revolutionary goddess who came up with a song as well. It's called Nizalwangobani. That song is a very powerful song. It's a powerful statement as well. It's a question and an answer in itself. I meet a lot of people who say to me, this song reminds me of my grandmother who passed away. I remember Utandi such as framing Umatigizela as Ikawe, right? It's very rare you would see Umama with tears, you know, in her eye. And when she saw Tandiswa performing and, and doing that, she was really, really excited. For me, music has definitely been that place where I could heal my own wounds. Um, it also became a place where I could 
encounter other people's wounds. So leading up to the week of uh, Mama's funeral, Tandusa hosted a women's only concert in Newtown. Oh my God. Nisa Longobani was our first song. It went into a very long trance at the end of just calling her name. And on that day, usually I'm like, Matikisela. You know, that's how I do it. On that day, it was kind of rumbling out of my stomach. It was like, Yay, Matikisela. Yay, Matikisela. was roaring out of me and I kept saying it and I kept saying it and I kept saying it and after that I sat down I was finished she takes us through a lot of different emotions from raunchy and sexy to angry and political and sentient and spiritual you know and it was a full moon that night there are many 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 songs that honor Mamwini but there's a difference when the song is a confrontation we were all in tears, hugging, holding each other. We were able to even walk around, you know, bare-breasted. We knew something was happening, we just didn't know what it was. And the next day, we wake up to the news that Mama has died. And it just felt like we were at the right place at the right time. You know, during her last days, our wish we understood that it was her last days, but I, I thank God that that is hidden from us. It felt like your grandmother died, but it also felt like Superwoman had died. So Tandiso's music at that particular point in time allowed us to be able to say goodbye. We'll now call Tandiso Mazwai to render one item, please. One item. To sing at Mama Winnie's funeral was the most heartbreaking thing I've ever had to do. And to sing in, in, in front of in front of our coffin. It was just unbearable. Of, um, you know, black women musicians that are unafraid to own where they come from. Oh, oh, oh Tande, so are drawing from Umambusi, but Umambusi is drawing from Umdwanu Makoko. Umdwanu Makoko is drawing from multiple women. And one of the things that she would say about these songs is that these are the songs that if one day God remembers her, the songs will stay on. When those songs are played now, you feel that she really multiplied. Welcome back um, wow, to the second half of the um, dialogue today for the Tikana Riabua. Um, and uh, we're just 
I'm struck with this movie. There's so much. I think we could spend more than an hour talking about it because there's so much to unpack. Um, and I think what was so beautiful was, um, I can't remember the names of the people in the film, please forgive me, but there was someone who said how, you know, the artists were drawing on each other and the one was drawing on, you know, right back to history. So uh, artists now and artists like um, Mam Miriam Makeba and Lucy Matlongo and other artists and their, their, their work is speaking to each other and links quite nicely with what we were saying earlier. But I want to bring Danny in this time um, to, to maybe just share with us you know, how does this documentary make you feel? What are your initial reactions and what are the things that really sit with you as important to discuss in this film? Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's an incredibly moving documentary. And for me, watching things like this that show the place of culture in our society is a reminder of why I'm a culture actor and why I'm a culture editor, because of what music um, and art and photography and film makes possible. And I think that um, Tandiswa articulated really well in the, in the documentary where she says music gets to places where we cannot reach. And it echoes a, a quote from Angela Davis that I um, included in my op-ed where she'd said it's through visual art, fictional literature, films, music and fashion that our deep emotions can be transformed. Um, and I think that that's really the true power of culture in our society is that it, it, it offers that um, potential for revolutionary transformation. And for me, this film um, is, is a, a deep illustration of that, of the, the, the way that, you know, um, cultural artifacts, be it a, a, a song or um, a, an image, can be enjoyable just in and of itself, but can be transformational. It's really powerful. I mean, just thinking, um, you know, in your paper, you also wrote um, watching uh, Tandis Wamas Wise an act of witnessing the transformative power of art. And, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Being at the Riaboa, it was such an intense moment and everybody could felt moved um, and there was really a power of collective um, in that space. It was it was a very beautiful space. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Danny, just sticking with you for a bit. You, Could you I wrote... just reflect on that for a second? Yes. yes. Because I, do, I love watching Tandisa perform and Tandisa, you know, is the, it's one of the clearest articulations of that, that immense transformational power of art and which is why I write about it so much in that op-ed. Um, but I think what was also so powerful about, about that day uh, was watching um, Tekano CEO, Lebora Mafoko and um, Chandiswa on stage talking about where Nizablan Wobani comes from. And Tandiswa articulating, you know, that sense of the song arriving from a place that she didn't know. But it, that, that just, that sense of the genesis of the song um, mm -hmm. was just so powerful because we, we got the moment or got a chance to hear to speak about the kinds of things she was trying to um, cement in that song. Um, and I think that, you know, it allowed a different understanding of, of a song that's profoundly moving in and of itself, whether you're hearing it on the radio or to see it performed is just such an it's an act of profound power so mm -hmm. i think that that's um to hear, and i think that that resonates and is is so central to the documentary as well is that sense of really understanding the the kind of concentrated power of that song mm -hmm. thank you um that's really incredibly um important and I think it reminds me a little bit of the role of song in South African historically as a form of protest, as a form of gathering, as in its revolutionary power. And without saying too much, I want to ask Charlene to perhaps comment on the role of music and song for you and the woman that you you with, the woman on farms. Okay, um, thanks. Um, it was really a powerful um, 
documentary in the video. I think um, I'm really inspired by Mom um, Winnie Mandela, and especially because she wasn't just a social worker, but she was a social worker taking the structural violence that we as that was that time, but now also currently is still um, happening in our society. So for me, um, when I watched the video and I heard and um, this was singing, I literally went on YouTube and watched a funeral. And I think when I, I got a bit emotional when I watched the, the video because it was not just her singing, but his voices that were connecting. It is 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 a form of movement. It's a is a, a form of um, revolution. There were thousands of people. They were all singing. The people's eyes were closed. They could you can feel feel the raw in in the video. And and I felt emotional by, by the fact that um, a song can do that. It can bring people together. Um, and it, the voices connect, and it is a really powerful way of, of uh, um, saying something or, or, or uh, stating something that is, is happening. But I think for me, um, when I went with women to an over, for example, a memorandum at Parliament, the women will just start singing, and they will start singing um, in their own language. They will start singing in Afrikaans. They will start just start singing. Um, people who can't read and write, they will just start singing. You know, one of the things also that women was doing, they, they will use songs that they know that I use in church. They will mix that song up and they will make it a revolutionary song. Um, and then you can just, just hear when they say, the plaats werkers as on my tafel sit, dan is hulle gevaarlik. So they will use slang words, but they will sing together um, as a collective. Um, when they end over the well, they want to speak to a government official and say, but we want toilets, we want our own land. Before a woman takes the mic, they will start to sing. They will they, they will use song as an expression of, of saying that we had enough, we are done, we are over this. Give us our land, give us, stop the farm evictions. So for me, a song is just not um, 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 um words, but it's a type of emotion, bringing people together. Um, in there are days when I was sitting in a room, people would just start singing and then the tears would just flow because you will feel the emotion, you will feel the, the hopelessness, you will feel the, the anger, the emotion in the room. Um, and then for me, that, that is power, uh, um, just women singing, expressing how they feel. And I think while I watched the video, um, Lebo Khan spoke about the fact that people were hugging each other at the concert. They were they were singing. They were, they removed their tops, their t-shirts. They were they, they the boobs were sewing. And I think I was jealous a bit because I really wanted to be at a concert. And I felt like, especially now in this pandemic, people need a hug. A woman needs to be hugged, and a woman needs to say to each other that we you got this. Um, we are in this together. And I think that concert was uh, when I watched the video. It was so powerful. Them hugging each other, um, 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 crying, the emotions, they got angry, they were happy. And I think we long for that type of spaces. Um, um, you, we see on, on, on in the internet, on social media platforms, on TV, women are being killed every single day. And for me, we need, we are longing for those types of um, spaces where we can just hug each other, where you can just say we are angry, we had enough. So for me, it was a really powerful video. And I think song is about, it's a way of connecting voices. It's a way of uh, mobilizing. It's a way of movement. Um, um, yeah, so it was a really, really powerful video. Thanks, Anas. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the thing is that, Charlene, you pick up on so many points about the role of song song is not just words it's emotion it's a form of mobilizing it's a form of connecting it's um you know danny spoke about the transformative power of song and um you know even charlene's like desire to be at this concert where women are so deeply connected um you speak about the sense of possibility even if it's briefly this that that music offers um and i just wanted you to reflect a little bit on that and i'm, I'm thinking especially around the gender idea of women who exist and and navigate our world but often through the lens of men or through the lens of the structures that control us. And it becomes really difficult to know how to connect to your core, to connect to that feeling, to connect to the center, to your intuition, to know what's right for you or what's wrong for you. 
something that you know you were talking that that rumbles in your belly and with that place where the song for that came to Tandiswa came from um and i wonder if if as a cultural writer you see this or as you watch women um discount themselves um self-sabotage um accept violence on their bodies um you know are unable to always see see themselves accurately as the queens and as the amazing woman that we really are um i don't know if you've got a comment on that really thanks <laughs> <laughs> um i think that i'm gonna go with what you were speaking about in the beginning of of that question which was about moments of possibility and i think that moments of possibility are fundamentally important for us as we continue the work the work that we're trying to do to fundamentally shift the world um and you know those moments of possibility can come from many places but i think what both tandiswa and angela davis point to is that culture all different forms of culture offer that moment of 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 um illuminating potential of showing us that that things can be changed and giving us moments of of revolutionary hope and i think that's what that's what culture can open up and what watching someone like tandiswa does is um give you a sense that the world can be transformed and in an environment where we repeatedly face structural violence of numerous different kinds we need those moments um a friend a friend uh zara julius calls it moments of flight so moments that offer us something different or allow us to briefly escape the conditions of our realities and offer us a glimpse of another world a way of living otherwise so for me that's the 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 deep thing that culture and revolutionary culture can provide is through giving us that moment of flight offering us a vision of an alternate different world that is constructed on more um on a more equal basis wow um i i think that really does speak to this the need for us to um nurture our imagination and activate the side the possibility of a alternative space or alternative world where in these moments um we can see and we can then envision and dream and build towards that um and charlene i wonder if the women on farms um you know given the the layered structural um conditions of oppression that they live in how do they and how do you develop that sense of hope or how do you do you find moments of possibility in your life and in your work thanks so i just need to unmute myself again so i think for me um we i see or the the moments of possibility you know is to the children in the the young adults that i'm working with and i think um i can't even describe the the magic in them or the magic how they are i hope in those communities um they are so keen in 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 motivated to continue with the projects to start the projects if we if i forget we have a meeting or I, we need to do educational drama they will be here we need to do the drama at 5 o'clock they will be here at 3 o'clock already and asking ya frau wann gaan ons begin when will we start so for me they are our reminders they are our hope in the community so i think the children and the youth growing up on the farms are our sense of purpose and our sense of hope so the voice amplifies project is a project where um it deals the, the primary um the, the the aim is to equip the children and the youth going up on the farms because remember the adults will pass but the children and the young adults will remain so so for me they are out they will come in us and the, i will use them is the give out the pamphlets give out our flyers go and tell your mother to tomorrow, tomorrow's a meeting um cut this paper um put up the um the posters so for them 
they are part of the, the history, they are part of making the change, seeing the difference in our society, in our community. Um, and then being included in the space is the sense of possibility, sense of purpose, um, in just an informal conversation. So so we are trying to do several TikToks. Um, so we are about 60 children. Um, so just to do one TikTok, I never uploaded one TikTok because they are too much, they are wild, they are singing and they're doing their own songs. So so um, on Friday, we're going to have the education. Tomorrow, we're going to have the drama. Um, so so they're rehearsing. They're rehearsing by themselves. They are praying and going to their parents' house, telling them that you must come to the drama. You must be part of the drama. So they, they are our possibility. They are our, our hope. And I think I feel and I, I get my sense of hope through the children that I'm working with. Um, and then... When I die one day, they will remain and they will be here continuing the work in, in talking about um, the structure of violence that needs to change um, and all these issues that they are currently uh, facing. So for me, it is, so children are the hope that in my possibility in the, my community. Thank you for that. Um, good luck on Friday. Um, I wish I could be there to watch the... Um, drama unfold and um, I know you were rehearsing last night and so I think it's just amazing the amount of time and effort and energy you put into uh, building and working with these children on top of your studies so I wish you all the best. Um, I, I just wanted to reflect a little bit then on um, you know this video showcased and spoke and named so many women and so many powerful black women were being interviewed um, in different roles, whether they were the PA to Winnie Mandela, whether they were artists, activists, um, uh, academics, all of them were such powerful uh, perspectives and lenses and, and feelings that, that came forward. Um, and, and I think um, they, what was interesting for me is, is, is in relation to the previous film, we learning about Loretta after her passing, you know, and we want to now go back and engage with her. With Winnie, it's maybe a similar-ish picture. Some of us have learned and engaged with her, but we're only learning about the power of her even through this Rehaboa experience and really, really sitting with it. Um, here you have these women in the film who were interviewed each of them so powerful in their own right, as academics, as activists, as PAs, as Tandiswa Maswai is, is an artist that is loving and breathing and, and, and teaching us as in this moment. So in a way, there's, there's, a, there's a different way in which we are looking at women, you know, and another woman that comes to mind is um, uh, Maryam Makeba, who, who was a woman, an artist, um, who traveled the world, who had many um, passports for many different countries. She spoke at the UN. She was a revolutionary. She influenced culture in America, you know, and yet we also somewhat don't really know her. Um, and, and so I think uh, I have, I wonder if you can reflect on that a bit, um, Danny, but then there's a second part to my question, just to make things confusing. It's this idea that as women stand up to perform, we often um, consume their art in a, in a part of our brain that is quite like um, capitalist, consumerist. Um, and, you, and you wrote a little bit about that. And I wonder if you can reflect on how do we learn and engage with the, these women who are with us and around us um, and in our history. And yeah, thanks. Um, so to the first part of your question, I think that um, what I've come to realize is that we're always archiving, we're always writing history in the now. I think with even the narratives that we were seeing unfold around COVID at the moment and the variant, we're seeing how um, narratives get skewed with immediacy and how correcting the record is something that we have to do continually at all times to make sure that um, cultural memory is, is institutionalized in very different ways. And I think that that, um, 
that is something that that comes to mind with your question and also um when you speak about the the question of knowing i always think about um Pumla Kola introduced me to uh, Habiba Badarun's formulation of ambiguous v visibility, that you can be invisible even when you're in plain sight. And I think that many, um, many um, women and people of marginalized communities become ambiguously visible, um, where you are known in perhaps name or for a specific thing, a song, a movie, but your complexity, your full humanity is not archived. And I think that that is the kind of records that we're continually correcting, that it's not simply okay just to know of someone, but it's about um, making sure that cultural and institutional memory remembers people in their full complexity. Um, and then to your to your second point, I think that the best way to even think about that is um, just to draw from from someone whose uh, I think work is is incredibly important is Gwen Ansel, um, and I'll 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 quote from from the article because I think that um, what um, she said at a at a keynote address um, for the, the Forges political revival event is really important, where she said, the arts, far from being something just to be consumed, are voices to recall, express, and if necessary, reshape culture and heritage. And then she traces the emergence of the official view that flourishes today, which she says is of the arts as something people buy, not something people make, and as a servant of official policies. Um, and I think that that is, that is a really important um, thing that she is drawing our attention to, is, is art's revolutionary p potential as, a, as opposed to art as something just to be consumed and bought um, and, and viewed through a kind of capitalist lens, which leads to the kind of um, situation that we're in institutionally in South Africa, where the art is, art is viewed as just entertainment and not for its progressive potential. Thank you. I mean, I think that it's it actually is quite um, interesting how narratives um, get changed and warped like almost immediately. I think COVID is an actually an excellent example of that. But it also does feel quite um, interesting how, as um, a liberation movement, the ANC, when in during the struggle against systemic oppression and apartheid, um, song and was used in a particular way. But then the moment that ANC came into power, um, there was a rewriting of artists and, and a rewriting of the ways in which um, music becomes something different. And in a way, it's, it's about um, allegiance to a party that has lost some of its values, including gender equity, you know, um, which I'm not sure that the ANC ever was quite gender um, sensitive or gender transformative from the beginning, but um, it's almost, uh, I think from what you're saying, uh, it's uh, making me realize that we have to constantly be questioning. We constantly need to be reflective and we constantly need to be aware of what the the narrative is the meta narrative but then what is the complexity N not just around an issue but around people and around songs and to really deepen our understanding and not take it at face value and in that way you won't really consume it but you engage it and and really um, interrogate your our own understanding uh, and keep open possibilities for for understandings that we may not have yeah um, thank you. I, I want to go now to um, Charlene, and I um, I think for me one of the things that perhaps is not really touched on in the documentary, but I think it makes um, one of the reasons why Winnie is such a um, incredible figure. And thinking about the films yesterday that were shown in the Riabua around Winnie being a social worker and you are studying to be a social worker. And uh, I wondered, you know, um, 
if there's something around Winnie's life story that inspires you in a way that you know, these women are inspired by her to the point that they're writing songs for her and invoking her in struggles um, like the Fees Must Fall struggle and um, the contemporary struggles that, that ha are happening today. Thanks. Thank you, Sanaz. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I'm really, in I, I said earlier, I'm inspired by Mam Winnie. Um, until I think when I, I studied something else, I studied um, agriculture and business development. But while I was working um, at Women on Farms Project, what I usually found was when I was working with a case, I couldn't go into course because um, I can't work with the case fully because I'm not a registered social worker. Um, and then there was one thing that was limiting me for, for, for actively being part with the case, for example. So so for me, I, I, I just decided last year I'm going to leave and then just start my first step by starting social auxiliary and then doing my degree. So so I, I the reason why I'm inspired by Mama Winnie is the fact that she didn't work um in an isolated issue on isolated issues. She worked with um intersectional issues. So she she knew that for me to work with poverty or to speak about a woman's issues, I need to speak about gender. I need to speak about the access to food. I need to speak about the access to land. I need to speak about what is happening in our society. So, you know, one of the documentaries, um, she was a nurse. People will come to her when they are sick. She was providing people with clothes, with food, with all these different elements. Um, she saw that intersectionality is important when we speak about structural violence and white supremacy and capitalism and all these uh, um, factors and elements in our society. So for me, I'm inspired at the fact that she didn't, um, and remember when you study social work, you are, there's a curriculum and it's so, it's so, I, I did this, uh, I, I, I workshop um, on Wednesday, I think, I did a workshop with 40 students. And I'm only doing my certificate, but I was doing the workshop with 40 students and I was telling them about, you must every time you must know you was you, in in college and university you are doing the curriculum in a certain way, but in reality it's much different. So we are being taught in 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 the curriculum about a meso macro and all these things, but in reality it's different. There are structural violence and things in society that you need to tackle for you to deal with the. Uh, to the child, for example, you need to deal with the different factors. Why doesn't the child eat food? Why is the child? Why is, this, why is there no toilets in the house? Why is there no electricity in the house? So for me, I'm inspired by my mom. We need by the fact that she didn't just work and focus on social work, but she she was an activist. She was a feminist. She was she she, she worked with all these various issues. Um, in in in, I think I'm inspired by the fact that when I'm done with my degree, I will continue doing the work that she was doing, not only working with um, uh, um, one isolated case, but I will ask the question, but why? Why is it happening? Why is our society still struggling? Why is our society still trapped in this condition in, in, in people can't pass, um, go to town because a farmer closed the gate, there's a gate. So, so the, the freedom of movement, why is this still happening? Why is people working still on the farm? They are going to work, but they are come back. And when women want to go to the toilet, they must use the vineyard or the bush. So why is this happening? So so for me, it is, I want to finish my degree and do my degree, but I want to be a different type of social worker. I want to be a mom, Winnie Mandela type of social worker. So, and I want to take on the state. I want to take on the government. I want to write submissions. I want to be involved. I want to engage. And I want to be unapologetic about the fact that I, I will speak my truth and I will tell the stories of those affected, my own story in the kids on the farms if, uh, in, in, in rural communities. So I think for me, this is a, re, a true, true inspiration. And I, and I in, in, in a one sense, I'm a bit sad or emotional because the fact that I didn't hear anything about Mom Winnie Mandela was, like I said earlier, when I was in school. So, so, so for me, for the importance or the, when after I watched the video, um, is the fact that I need to continue telling a story. In in it's my responsibility to continue telling a story, um, where we uh, um, not only talk about um, the new generation, but also those before us. Um, so I'm really really inspired by her. In that, I think the reason for me being inspired is the fact that um, she was unapologetic and she didn't tackle only one issue. She tackled the structure. She tackled the the, the, the systemic violence. Um, yeah, I get so, 
I when I talk, then I use my hand. So thank you, Shanas. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I think it's it's really incredible how unapologetic she was, you know, as as a defiant woman, and this film showing many defiant women, powerful women, women who are willing to put their bodies on the line um, to create change, you know. And and I think someone in the film spoke about song as a confrontation. Um, we spoke about songs as revolution and songs um, as, as a form of liberation. And I, I, I wanted to ask um, Danny um, something. I have a question about this embodiment of, um, of this revolution through song or through art. And I wonder if you've got something to share about the ways in which women embody um, their feelings to share. And, and I think it, you even wrote a little bit about it in reflection of um, a poem that was read by Napo Mashiane. Um, and you said, words become embodied as she imbued each with the full weight of feeling and meaning intended by her pen. Um, and I, I'll just stop there. <laughs> Uh, can you rephrase the question just so I make sure I fully understand what you're asking? I I think for I, I I'm not sure I have a question as such, but more to kind of comment or reflect on this embodiment of. No, I think that I think that what really what really struck me um, about the the Takano engagement on the day, and I think that uh, Bongi we had a question about how do we embrace her greatness while accepting her weakness in a face in the face of a patriarchy that downplays her contribution by elevating her weakness. Um, and I think that that is what really struck me about that day was embracing a the full complexity of someone's humanity um, and dealing with a, a, a complex portrait as opposed to an official record, an official state record, an apartheid state record, or um, dealing with a um, an idea that is is only deals in elevation um, as opposed and and erases certain parts. What was really quite um, what had struck me on that day was the the sense of a feminist record not being a perfect record or, or being something that erases um, difficulties and complexities, but something that puts them in context and that engages them as questions, but also keeps an eye on institutionalized histories that are shaped by these patriarchal structures and questions them at the same time. And I think that that's what that kind of uh, feminist archiving, um, the work of people like Songen Simang, the work of people like Pumla Chola, um, does is it allows us to reckon with those difficulties as a as opposed to erasing them or subsuming them under iconography because what iconography also does is present a portrait of someone that doesn't allow us to engage them as fully human. Um, so I think that that's what what I find really important about that Decano about the Decano project is the ability to reckon with the complexity and the difficulty of, of these questions that must be asked. Thank you. Um, I think that is a way better answer than whatever question I was trying to, to raise. But I think um, uh, it really um, does sit with me, this idea of even the way we look at ourselves as women. Um, can we embrace the complexity that we are um, and and how do we tap into all the different um, parts of ourselves and really nurture ourselves to um, individually and as a collective to, to imagine the world that we want to be in. And I think it really links back to what um, Charlene was talking about, um, the, the complexity of issue that even Winnie was addressing it's the social determinants of health and why her work is related to the work of health equity because it addresses, it sees health as so much more than just um, the absence of illness, but to really look at are we living a dignified life and what does that dignified life look like and what is the prerequisites for a dignified life 
and how can we hold the state accountable to providing us with the education we need, the safety that we need, parks and, and recreational spaces, opportunities to play, um, opportunities to engage with music and art and to value the things that are really important for us to, to live that whole um, and dignified life. I wanted to just bring attention to some of the, the, the comments. Uh, so thank you, um, Danny, for also talking about that. And Bongani talks about the church songs that were um, from yesterday's discussion and how Umama used the church, a tool of colonization, for her movement building in Brantford and church, uh, the church woman um, is where she started. So how she, you know, used all the spaces to to bring where song is taught and where song is so present in women across South Africa's lives um, to mobilize and to do the kind of work that she was doing in, in those communities. Um, and then Sean says that as a male raised by a single mom, um, women are much more powerful than they can they they get credit for um yeah so so and then anele um i think that we we addressed anele's question i think um yeah as well as bongani that was quite similar so we coming towards a close um and i wanted to so it's 10 minutes left but i wanted to offer charlene an opportunity to maybe share with us a little bit of the um some of her own creative work and perhaps you can share with us the work and maybe something around it you know um thank you i'll just start there. oh shanash shanash so, so, so I think um, my creative work is mainly around educational dramas. So I, I, I really like writing. I really love writing dramas, um, and especially dramas um, where but that is participatory in our society, in our community. So, so for me, I don't usually have a script. I have an introduction, for example, and then I got characters. And I like where the children or the women um, put in their own words um, and they are telling their own stories. Um, but before we do or the right or go get a team for a drama, we have a session where we identify issues or problems we want to highlight in the drama. So sometimes we get people coming in our society, in our community, saying, but this is a problem without speaking to the kids or the people in the, in the community first. So for me, it's always important going into the community um, or where I'm staying, just talking, um, drawing up posters, making posters in dates, saying that silent alcohol and substance abuse is a problem. Um, Gender-based violence is a problem. Um, uh, in it, um, uh, drug abuse is a, a problem. So the norms in our society is a problem. So for them, by saying, okay, this is a problem, then we start writing the drama together. So just one example yesterday, so so they was asking me, but where's the script? Where's the last page of the script? And I told you, but you are the script. You must make your own words. You must tell people what you want to say. So for me, for me that itself is power. In 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 this last section, um, because this this drama is around the one that I like the fit around alcohol and substance abuse and dependency, the link between alcohol and child neglect, um, the link between poverty and um, unemployment, the link between poverty and food insecurity. They, they're also talking about the gender, um, the violence in the house, um, in the mental impact on the mother, but also the child. So, and then they were talking about financial abuse. Without them saying those words, they they know what is happening in the house and know what is happening in our society. So, so, so there's a element where the the father is beating the mother and the child comes in and she, 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 she was crying and just, she just stood up and started talking. Um, so for me, if I needed to write a script, I would put in my own words and my own understanding in my own past. So for her telling her own stories and then um, there's a scene where one of the, the child dies, you are stabbed, and the father stood up in, in, in the, the boy that is now the father in the, in the script that was abusing the mother. He started talking. So he linked his character to his own father. And he's saying, but he's, he's telling the community um, to stop in, in, in the importance of, um, of, of um, the violence in the house on, his, on himself, what is happening in our society. So for me, it is, it is how I use art um, um, in to heal, but also with 
kids and women can tell their own stories. I don't like writing scripts and then expecting to act it out word by word. You are the script, you are the voice, you are your own story. And the, the other thing that I'm busy with, I didn't like, I don't like readings a lot, a lot. So I like movies. I'm addicted to movies. So, so one thing that I started last, beginning of this year, is writing my, my own story. So I think the story, that, what you spoke about earlier, is a story of my mother. So the erasure of my mother. So, so, so for me, I started a, a, a chip, different chapters. The one, the first chapter is about, I, rem I, I don't remember, but I remember. So I speak about issues in my childhood where my mother lost a, a stillborn. She lost a child. She was pregnant. She was happy. And suddenly she lost her fiance. She lost a child. Without me understanding what is happening, I, 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 I could I not identify, but I, I saw in my child's eyes, I saw something is missing. Something is happening with my mother. I saw her transforming in, in, in dating men that are abusive. Um, she became, she didn't drink, so she became, became you know, dependent on alcohol. So, so in chapter two, I speak about blood, um, tears in water. So in that um, chapter, I speak about the fact that she's, she's now dating this man uh, that are accused of being rapist. Um, me as a child seeing her being beaten, me taking house pipes and spraying them, them with cold water, um, her covering up the boy, the man with the jacket, continuously saying, they can do it, and as a mild man can do it, he's going to die, and he's going to die. Are you mad? He's going to die. And I speak about the fact that I saw her fading away in every relationship. But my last, um, hopefully not my last, but the chapter that I'm currently in is where I speak about her being a human and not an object or, or, or the trauma that I was growing up with. So I usually, I was so angry with my mother. I like, it's because of why I'm dealing, still dealing to heal and going through the trauma. So for me, it was a way of dealing and healing, but also a way of telling her story because she was also suffering from her own trauma. So for me, it is basically around not erasing my mother, but telling a story in, 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 in a different lens, um, I'm, I'm also talking in the in this chapters. I'm talking about how a, a beauty, how she looked. I'm talking about her hair, a thick hair. I'm talking about her skin color. I'm talking about her character. Um, she was really funny. She liked to sing, and her favorite thing every time she yells at me, she will sing "Amazing Grace." So I'm I'm talking about uh, of elements in in sometimes society see women as objects, as as as, as things. So so especially men in their are uh, us. Um, hypersexualized um, on social media. So for me, I'm telling the story of my mother to her trauma, but also to my own experience in seeing her as my mother, Sarah Arendse. So in not just, oh, I drunk her, for example. So, so, so yeah, I'm currently busy with that. So, yeah. I wanted to read something from the thing, but I think I, I summed it up a bit. Um, and I also, sort of for my last, second last paragraph, I spoke about the, the way she died, um, in 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 how I was later adopted by my other aunt, and I speak about the gender roles in the things I went through as a growing growing up as into adulthood. So that is how I I'm starting to heal. I'm starting to take responsibility for my purpose to heal, but also telling my mother's story and not erase my mother from from my memory in the memory of of, of those who knew her, and seeing my mother in me. In telling people, but I am my mother child. I am Sarah Arms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow, it's really beautiful. And uh, I just want to say thank you to both Danny and Charlene for being here, for sharing um, your beautiful insights and just for, um, for, for an incredible conversation. So I know that everybody needs to leave. So I'd just like to ask for a round of final words um, from Danny and then Charlene, and then I will hand it back. Um, to, I will actually just close the, 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 the session today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to say thank you to both of you um, and to everybody who has been with us and commented and contributed contributed to this conversation. I think that this Rear Board Dialogues is such an um, interesting and important project and um, a feminist act of historiography that I think is is really, really fundamental. So thank you to both of you and to everyone. 
Yeah, um, I also want to thank, yeah, thank it, both of you guys for being part of the discussion, but also the Kano for inviting me. Um, and I then I want to thank um, those in the comment sections and those who are part of the discussion. But I just want to also remind, remind ourselves that we are also human and we need to take care of ourselves in the spaces um, and we need to share the responsibility when it comes to social justice, when it comes to healing, when it comes to learning. So so for me, it is about responsibility, but also about um, knowing where you are currently in, in, in heal from your past um, while you're healing the community. And, 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 and like um, Mam Winnie said, when we speak, we must speak about the we in the collective, but we not to forget about the I. So, so yeah, thank you, Janaz, and thank you, Denny. It was a really powerful discussion in my viewpoint. Thank you. Um, and with that, I also would like to say thank you to everybody who joined us today, and a special thank you to Lebo, Severa, Crystal, Bongani, and everybody at the Tecano team for making this possible. It's really been incredible at all of us. Um, are moved and we were quite nervous coming into this space and we weren't sure how it will turn out or what we will say but look at us two hours later <laughs> we've managed to to show up <laughs> and uh, <laughs> have have an incredible conversation um, tomorrow there'll be an inc a documentary on women on minds directed by Lesedi uh, Oh, I'm not going to, I don't know how to pronounce it, Maholeti and Yumna Martin. And uh, that will really depict women in the mining industry and the impact of women and the political economy of the extractive um, industry. So uh, I encourage everybody to tune in for, for that tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye.